Welcome to Storytelling in VR, presented by Mindshow. Please welcome your panelists, Bryn Muser, Angela Haddad, and Gil Barron, and moderator Chris Edwards. Hi, everyone. Oh, man, it's so great to be here. I was, I was actually at the very first VRLA session and just, you know, how grassroots that was and now how, to see what it's become. And in fact, I wanted to give a, a personal shout out to my good friend Johnny Ross, who was here the, during the keynote. And he was really the first person that introduced me personally to the, what I'm calling the second revolution of VR. And um, so, you know, look at how much has happened since then. We've all gone hog wild with VR. So we're here to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and it's storytelling in general. But when you have storytelling in a highly visual medium, it gets even more exciting. And I would argue to say that, that VR is pr perhaps the most intense highly visual medium. So um, I am Chris Edwards, the CEO and co-founder of the Third Floor Previs Studio. <laughs> So my, all my employees clapping, so <laughs> thank you. All right, um, better lunch on Fridays, guys. Uh, and then also I'm the very proud co-founder of a new company called VRC, the virtual reality company. And together we got together recently and created the Martian VR experience, which was a, a pretty intense VR experience in collaboration with the great and powerful Fox Innovation Lab. And, um, and we're taking that knowledge and parlaying it into a lot of other amazing, more original content that we're authoring ourselves that we'll be able to announce hopefully in future conventions. But we're really here to talk about the essence of storytelling. And instead of hearing it from me, I'd really like to hear it from our amazing panelists. And I'm the most interested, I think, not so much in the story itself. We all know what a story is, but it's the telling part of the storytelling um, that is so interesting because you have a choice as an author, an auteur of a, of a new visual experience, to tell that in many different ways, which then basically tells you that you have a, a choice, a point of view. And But what does that point of view look like, and what kinds of things can we do in VR to influence and enhance um, the media. So we have to look at the entire spectrum of what's happening in media these days from uh, the film, TV, commercial side of traditional Hollywood. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have gaming. And so it's everything from the passive narratives that are the same for every single audience member to the open, open interactive worlds of say Minecraft or other uh, pure, pure gaming applications. So it begs the question, where does VR and AR fit in this spectrum? And there's a really wide range, obviously, of different experiences that can happen. There's some, some totally passive, some totally interactive, and some perhaps in between. So we're very fortunate today to have uh, three prestigious panelists that are all sitting in the right order. Um, and uh, so let's start with Gil Barron, who's holding down the fort with the more CG side of uh, VR at the moment. So um, Gil, I'd like for you to give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself, if they don't already know you from this prestigious organization, and what you're up to. Sure. So hi, um, uh, my name is Gil Barron. I'm CEO of Visionary VR. We uh, announced uh, and provided a first look at our app mind show uh, yesterday and today here on the floor um, we have been working on storytelling in vr since uh, i think we've now gone the cycle where the people thought we were insane and now they know it is that we are um, where they were asking what is vr and we we were carrying our computers under one arm and our dk ones under the other to walk around and show people what it was um, but we've really been focused on uh storytelling and how you you know this is this is the most immersive medium we've seen uh, and, and, and potentially the most explosive as a result of that, but uh, you know, the, it, there's new language that has to be developed and so we've really been spending our time trying to figure out that new language and figure out you know, what, what, is this, uh, what does it mean 
when you when you have motion control in, 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 in your living room? What does it mean when you can walk around and look around? What does it mean when you're in control? Well, we're going to figure it out today, you know? <laughs> we've all been to so many panels where we've talked about generalities of what is emerging, and uh, I hope today that now, you know, over two years into this new effort in VR that we've actually concluded a few things about um, the film language of VR and other things. So thank you, Gil. And now moving on to Angela Haddad, who... Yep. <laughs> and Angela, would you tell us a little bit about the company, or well, perhaps your past work and some of uh, what brought you to the new company, as well as um, what inspires you to be in VR? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got my start in VR uh, doing animation. Uh, I actually draw by hand and animate uh, fashion art into 360 videos. Um, but I most recently joined Silver Thread as VR producer, and Silver Thread is a POV pioneer. We run the whole pipeline, including a proprietary POV rig. We have two divisions in our company. One of them is a learning and development division. We work with uh, companies who want to better um, help their employees understand how to do things without having them travel everywhere and all that stuff. And our other division specializes in entertainment. Um, we most recently, I'll talk about it later actually, but um, that's basically what we do. We specialize in POV VR. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And then last but not least, let's move on to Bryn. And Bryn Mooser is the VP and co-founder, correct me if I'm wrong, of Riot. CEO. Of CEO? All right. Even better. Who's counting? <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, Riot um, and, um, and your involvement in that, that uh, effort for all the amazing humanitarian work you're doing. Sure. Um, uh, Riot's an immersive media company specializing in 360 video for news and, and documentary. Um, we were just acquired by Huffington Post, AOL, Verizon. Um, so VP of AOL actually now, but CEO of Orion one. They'll just keep it off. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to keep it straight. Yeah, um, yeah. But now um, uh, working mostly on uh, news and documentary. So we launched um, uh, 360 cameras and, and post-production into all of the Huffington Post 15 international uh, news bureaus. Um, uh, and most recently covered the DNC, the RNC, and, and now the Olympics in, in 360. Wow, yeah. I saw all the balloons drop at the Democratic National Convention in, three, in 360, yeah. which was pretty cool. Thank so. you. We were really, that, that, um, in, that in particular was really exciting as we kind of go into storytelling anyway, um, because it took seven of us to, to make that one video. And wow. the goal of it was uh, we were really excited to show the balloon drop um, as quick as we could after it had happened. Mm. So the goal of all of the seven of us in the convention was to get that piece of 360 up before the last piece of confetti had dropped in the convention. As there was wow. like a seven person chain of people in the convention of somebody shooting it and then passing the card yeah. on and then we were in the Facebook office of putting it out there. It was fun to do that. So it was like the Olympics but with a thumb drive being passed. Yeah. <laughs> the Jeopardy theme song playing? Oh. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we had that uh, preparatory call and we got all excited about all those questions I was gonna ask you, which I will get to. But I figured since this is the last session and we're all a little tired and uh, I wanna keep it exciting. So I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit and do the first ever VRLA speed round of questioning. And okay. Yeah. All right. so, what I, so what I've done is I've uh, come up with some true and false. Um, <laughs> And uh, so each of you get one of these, okay. which are masterfully created by my team at the office. And so let's hand these out. Wow. And um, so I have, uh, I have just 10 questions. We'll let you get ready. You are know. these personal questions or VR questions? Yeah. They get more and more personal the closer we get to the end. My mom is in the audience, so don't make them too personal. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that you just hold up your answer. Don't even really think. It's just gut, gut reaction. It won't hold you to it. Uh, so we're going to start out with an easy one. All right? So first question, true or false? Virtual reality is an awesome new format for telling rich stories. Ding. <laughs> I knew it. Uh, storytelling is fundamentally more challenging in VR than in any other cinematic medium. 
Ooh, controversy. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, narrative VR experiences will someday be feature length or longer. Yes, that's my business model. <laughs> it, Is that why you were winking on that question? Hopefully we're right. Um, it's possible to translate the viewer in VR without causing simulator sickness. Yes. How about um, rotating the viewer and not causing uh, simulator sickness? <laughs> so that's a, that's a, Angela, that's a maybe and yeah. a depends. All right, hold that oh, we're thought. we're able to do it's maybe a... and depends, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get the maybe on, flag. Angela. Yeah, okay, yeah. Just for that side of the All right, number six. VR should be a seamless experience and not involve cutting. Good. Okay. <laughs> Woohoo. We'll talk about that later. Um, you know, the role of editing. Number seven, 360 video is a true form of virtual reality. Yes. <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, branching narratives will be a popular format in VR. Oh, good, okay, interesting. The role of the writer is fundamentally different on a VR project. Oh, wow. Oh. Writer in the house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any cinematographers here tonight? Yes. We want you involved. Um, number 10. Chris is an awesome moderator for forcing us to do this speed round and to make us commit to these generalizations. Oh. Oh, I'm touched. Okay, so that was the icebreaker. I think we might come back to some of those um, gut Especially reactions. The last one. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so let's get dive in a little deeper. I'm going to join you here. But as we go from the moment of conception of a VR idea into what we're visualizing as this limitless VR world or VR experience, I'm first interested in the process that you guys go through to prepare for the creative endeavor. Like, you know, whether you're working with a writer or not, um, what makes it different to prepare for a VR experience or VR shoot than in uh, other traditional medium? And how do you begin to predict what the viewer might see, um, you know, because there are so many options, so. Um, I'll start on that one. Um, I want to get back into some of those true and false ones, too, because I think it'll be good. But I mean, I think on um, a lot of the people from our company's background was as documentary filmmakers. Um, uh, many of the people who started our company uh, started actually as aid workers and humanitarians and doing photojournalism. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of the thing that I think has always fascinated us and always excited us about VR and the reason that as a company we started making more VR than we were making linear um, was that opportunity you have, I think, that we all know to transport somebody some, somewhere. And I think when you're um, lucky enough to um, uh, get a chance to be an aid worker or uh, travel overseas, um, you, you know, you change who you are and, and you learn and you have these experiences and, um, and, and all of these um, things change who you are. And so I think that not everybody's lucky enough to see all these amazing places all over the world. So we really see that there's this great opportunity to transport people places through VR. And so the first thing that we think about very different than if we're shooting linear is how do we bring somebody somewhere where um, they maybe have never gone before or couldn't go themselves. And so we're thinking about um, scale, scope, um, we're thinking about access, all of those things I think are, 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 are the first things that we think about um, before we start really shooting. Anybody else? I could just jump in on uh, as well as I think when uh, one of the key things is really about uh, experiential education, right? Just like, you know, the, that 
VR, to talk about VR is so fundamentally different from experience of VR. And so, you know, a lot of times, I think, especially uh, with uh, creative endeavors and, and, and storytelling, a lot of a lot of it is very heady and, you, you know, the history of it is in thoughts and then put into words and then put on the images. But with this sort of experiential layer that is added on top that doesn't have a vernacular behind it, I think a lot of it involves sort of educating people about the differences between them, uh, between the different mediums and the different idioms and, and, and letting that inform the creative process. So do you think that in preparing for like, say your, the first short film that you guys tackled, um, was that something that you did on paper, writing down beats, or did you do some storyboards? We, we, we did all of that and uh, threw them away as we, as we went. Yeah. Uh, just because, you know, we just sort of decided to crash on through and try and figure it out by doing. And so, you know, we started with the process that we knew and then we evolved the process uh, based on the medium, really, is what, what we found. And, and just to add to that piece there, like, um, you know, we, a lot of it is experimentation too. And so I think that what the most exciting thing, certainly for us, and I you know, hope everybody in this room, is that none of these rules are actually written yet. And so even the true and false one is difficult because like, um, you know, we don't know and nobody really knows, but what we can do is be passionate and experiment and try a lot and fail a lot. And there's best practices that we have, yeah. but um, it's, it's like literally up to everybody who's here at this conference to write the new rules for that. So, 100%. So, so Bryn, for you in a, like a documentary context, when you're going into um, an unknown situation, do you, do you have ideas in advance where you're like, man, I really hope that I can maybe move through the crowd and then end up you know, uh, in front of, of someone and, and make that an impactful camera move, for example. Do you have preconceived ideas? Or how do you riff off of that on, on set? I think what's good is that the, the people who, all of us who are shooting all the time, we come from a really scrappy documentary world where um, we don't have any money all the time. And so we're shooting things um, um, we're being really uh, conservative about what we're shooting. So because we don't have to put, we don't want to do a lot of post-production in that. And mm -hmm. I mean, it even comes from before that, a film school where, where you know, you can't be wasting a lot of film all the time. And I think that medium actually lends itself to, to the way that we shoot VR because we don't have a lot of time in news to be turning stuff around and shooting extra content that we want because we really want to make sure that the stuff we're capturing is the yeah. stuff that we're going to use. So there are times where we're coming back from a shoot and we only have 15 shots, you know, and, and, and we've got to make our story from those 15 shots. And so yeah. we do think a lot uh, about it before and then you have to be able to improvise. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on a little bit, I want to talk more seriously about film language, which is kind of an odd term to use when we're talking about VR because it has, doesn't have much to do with film really, but I do think that there is a language that's emerging in VR, so maybe VR language. Um, do you think that this language is being in any way informed by any other sort of traditional art form other than just cinema itself? I think there's a lot of inspiration that comes from theater in terms of blocking. You really do have to think outside the box quite literally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that in itself really makes a, you know, 360 storytelling its own art form, a really hacky art form, if you will. So what kinds of things in theater do you use, um, you know, elements do you use when you're thinking about approaching a VR experience? Um, so for example, if you're, uh, you know, it's with theater specifically, if you have a lot of things going on on stage, um, similar to VR, you can't really tell where somebody is gonna look. And um, I think especially with 360, that's taken to the extra level. <laughs> mm -hmm. So things like camera movement, lighting, sound design, that sort of thing? Absolutely, I mean, lighting is super critical in 360, but it's also it also presents itself to be a super immense challenge, right, because you can't have I mean, you have really have to think super creatively if you need artificial lighting, for example. Yeah. With sound, that's its own its own thing. We recently, um, this is slightly a tangent, but we recently worked on a POV music video, and we couldn't, because it's a music video, we couldn't have any extra sound cues, right? So that was in its own way a challenge. How do we make sure that the cues are proper enough that people know where to look and they're not overwhelmed by everything that's going on around them? Yeah. Because sound cues are out of the picture. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think um, a, a lot of us visual people, you know, the folks that went to film school and whatnot, like don't fully appreciate sound design. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think with VR, um, it is blatantly clear that that is at least 50% of the <laughs> Of, of, of the um, immersion 
uh, uh, in the sense of presence in VR. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about what we touched on in two of the questions about simulator sickness and uh, you know the elephant in the room. It seemed like very early on um, a lot of the hardware manufacturers were playing it extra conservatively, right, rightfully so, and they didn't want to you know, have any negative press about what was going to happen if you did the wrong thing in VR and uh, God forbid someone had a bad experience and would be close-minded to uh, other good VR experiences. But, I mean, have you guys experimented with different techniques, both in live action and perhaps in CG, that allows us to determine a few kind of tips and tricks or something that um, can be used as a guideline for those getting into VR now? Um, just specifically with uh, with POV, we've we've really experimented with movement a lot, and we've noticed that it works really well, especially when you take into account um, when you're changing f when you're changing scenes. It's really critical for us to think about inertia. For example, if you're going super fast in one scene, you don't want to cut to a different scene and have it suddenly stop because the body gets really, really confused. Mm. Um, so that's been super critical for us to think about. Um, when it comes to, to movement within the, within the scene, mm -hmm. um, we actually have a pretty crazy skiing piece where you're going, um, the skier is going at a super crazy rate and then he goes, um, he, he jumps off a 40 foot, um, 40 foot mount and it worked really well, I think, because partly because it is a POV experience. You're not just floating in space, and you you look down, you see a body, and you feel very much grounded within the experience, and it doesn't so much uh, make you feel a little wacky. It does seem that that um, sort of sense of being grounded is so important. I remember just our experience with the, uh, the Martian. Um, there was the one scene we were worried about, which is driving the rover. So you're driving around, but because there is this sort of many windows and you're in the cockpit, you feel like, um, you, you don't feel as queasy as you might because there's a sense that you're holding on to something. Uh, it's sort of like um, the feeling that a lot of people get when they're in the driver's seat of a car as opposed to being the passenger looking down and texting or something. I, I, think, I think it connects to one of your earlier questions, which is about like what are the disciplines that we can learn from. I think you know, there's some science around this the, you know, as like you're saying, the, you know that we're just discovering, and that's sort of being on the bleeding edge of this. Uh, you know, being in a cockpit makes you feel comfortable with motion, and that, you know, like you were saying, with inertia and continuity of motion. We did a lot of experimentation in our early days around camera work and cutting, um, uh, mostly because we were obstinate and we wanted to just <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> and 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 it, when it fails, it fails spectacularly, and when it works, it feels pretty great. I mean, that's the you know nice thing about you know filmmaking, right? That uh, you know good cuts don't draw attention to themselves um, and motion very much the same so uh, you know I well that's a, a really good transition to talk about editing um, as many of you know I mean I certainly believe that editing and the unsung heroes in a lot of movies are the editors that take a bin full of amazing individual clips but it doesn't really make much of a story or create a mood until it is cut together into something that resembles a movie or a sequence and yet um, it seemed to me that there was this debate about whether or not one could even cut because you feel like you're maybe teleporting to a different area. Although in the CG world of, um, you know, like in Epic Games with their, uh, what's it called, the, 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 their experience oh, the where you- Bullet Train. Where, bullet Train, yeah. So bullet, tra bullet Train where all of a sudden, you know, it, it seemed kind of natural in a CG context to be teleporting and reorienting yourself and now you can do something to uh, to be able to expand the amount of room that a, a viewer can go into. So, you know, I'm curious about this. I mean, do you guys uh, use editing creatively to help transport the, the viewer through your story? Yeah, I mean, I think that for us, <clears throat> we were talking about sound before. It's like sound design is key in, in, in this and, 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 and letting the story breathe a little bit. I mean, I think that where people have trouble is when you're cutting and expecting somebody to be able to see something that's behind them. And so if you don't craft, I think, that journey of the story in there um, cohesively through a sound design or through music or you know VO or whatever it is that's taking you through there, I think that's when you really find the problem with it. Um, but you know, again, I, I think that the way that, you know, I don't think that the actual format for how you tell story 
in VR and 360 has been discovered yet. You know, I think that we're all trying really hard to figure it out and, and, and everybody, you know, is trying to be the one who figures it out, I think. Um, but that format hasn't been figured out yet. You know, yeah. so it's like we, we I, I think that's where it does become evident where there aren't rules in that sense. You know, like I think that, you know, somebody should experiment with like a ton of cuts and, and jarring images and let's, we have to push it because somewhere within there is what will be the mm -hmm. format. But I guess until we have um, sort of a CG solution to maybe slow time, like what Gill's company has been experimenting with in the live action context, you just, I guess the rule of thumb, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to be uh, thinking about the sort of fluidity of motion and, and predicting as accurately as you can what people may on average be looking at from cut to cut so that you have some idea of hopefully where they might be looking through the cut. Yeah, I think, but I think that e I think that what we've got to start thinking about is that there's something beyond trying to just tell a narrative story within VR, right? Like, what's the next level that we can be thinking about rather than like, hey, there's a guy who comes in this door, like, I really hope you look at that guy, and then there's another girl who's in, they're going to fall in love, so you have to look over there. Like, we're still thinking about how we tell a story inside a box just that you can look behind you, and it's, it's, it's the next level beyond that, that it's not about... Like we have to rethink the way that we that that we tell a story. I think as a fi as filmmakers in this new medium. One of the things I think about a lot is um, my experience when I was a kid at the Air and Space Museum in um, in Washington D.C. And it was the first time I saw like a really big IMAX screen, and it was such a big screen that they only selectively used the entire screen sometimes to kind of blow you away and. It's one of the things that I thought might be part of the vernacular of the emerging language of, of VR is, do we have to use all the 360 all the time? Um, and, and how can we perhaps creatively um, use that for different impacts at different moments? Yeah, I mean, we, that was certainly something you know, we were exploring in, in sort of our earliest days. Um, and I think you know we're, we're one of the places we landed was is, is something that's true in digital effects as well. Is just because you can doesn't mean you should, yeah. right? So um, you know that I can look all the way around. You know I'm sitting in a chair. If something awesome is happening behind me. I'm going to have to work really hard to get over there and find it. So you know we have to consider sort of how the, the viewer is going to engage with it. And you know again just because I have 360 degrees. That was actually the first time since I got on stage that I looked back that way. Yeah. Yeah. Was it that interesting? It, well, it wasn't really. I don't feel like I was missing anything. <laughs> but I, I, I think about the way that um, uh, 3D used to work, right? When you got the little paper 3D glasses and they would flash a little image on the screen and that was the moment to put on your 3D glasses. Yeah. And now when we watch 3D, we're, we're wearing the glasses the whole time. So you know, I, I still think that as we baby step into what it's going to be, um, you know, I want to see films where I'm watching you know, I'm watching Star Wars, but I watch five minutes of it in, in 360, yeah. and the rest of it I can watch kind of in an IMAX screen. Yeah. You know, one thought I, I had um, recently is because my daughter's obsessed with Minecraft, um, and she, she said, Daddy, Daddy, I think Minecraft in VR is out. And so I, stu I was like, how can this be? How can I be totally <laughs> unaware of this? And sure enough, it was still just coming soon, but there was such a buzz about it. Um, so I read through the article and it said, oh, hey, one of the selling points for this to make you not apprehensive to buy this product is that we have sort of a comfort mode, if you will, that allows you to uh, zoom out of the POV and then you see essentially a floating screen and can play Minecraft just like you're watching it in your living room and then you can immerse yourself when you want to. Mm -hmm. Now that works great in, in um, I guess, an interactive setting, but. But what I wanted to get at is, do you guys play around with this idea of being a fly on the wall, you know, a just a person from a perspective, or um, and then the the um, the other option, which is you are totally in the mindset or in the position of a, a participant, if you will. Yeah, I think um, I think some experiences just don't work well in POV. Um, and we, we totally acknowledge that. You would that. know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we totally acknowledge that. Um, 
we, I mean, it's not uncommon for us to turn down projects just because they just don't make sense in POV. Um, I think some projects need to be done as a fly on the wall if you're floating through space or whatever it is. Um, and on the other hand, of course, if a story makes sense, it's so much more impactful to tell it through the shoes of a person. If you look down and see a body um, and you feel like it's yours, or maybe you don't feel like it's yours and that's a different experience entirely. Maybe you look down and you see hands that are a different race or a different gender or Maybe it's a person of disability, and it's an entirely impactful experience. Yeah. Have you done an experience um, where you basically you know, get into the POV, the transition in and out of POV, or does it always, to date, start with, like, hey, you're, you're there, you're this person, and you discover that? It's entirely in POV. Okay. Um, yeah, our proprietary rig films a 360 fully stereoscopic from, uh, I mean, everywhere, but... It's, yeah. yeah, you look down, you see a body, and that's the way we film. Bryn, do you, do you think about that, too, of like, okay, so say you're going to, um, you know, a, a war-torn scene, and you're like, well, wait, do I just want to film this sort of documentary style, or do I want to get up there where maybe there's a crowd of people, and, um, you know, I want to be one of those people so that I feel the, a more emotional impact of that scene? Yeah, I think that it, it depends on, on the story we're telling. It, it, you know, one of the th things that was really interesting when we first started out is that we did films for, we did news for uh, the Associated Press, we did one for the New York Times, we did a couple for Huffington Post at the beginning, NPR, and each of them had their own newsroom rules around what you could shoot. And so um, we, we, from the beginning, had these lively debates about like the tripod and the, the filmmaker and the journalist, because as we were shooting, we would hit record and then run and hide somewhere. And then sometimes that wasn't cool and sometimes it was cool. And a, as we started to get more excited about telling it, um, that idea, and you were talking about it before, where you can see everything is really exciting. Um, and, and I think for f from a doc filmmaker's perspective, it's like the, the truest or the closest to cinema verite, where you can have the opportunity to show everything and you don't uh, you see a camera crew. You know, it's not like with, with Linear where you've got a camera crew hiding and the craft services table. Like, there's a way to do it where it's where you really can get in there. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, in a lot of places where we shoot, a, a VR camera doesn't really look like a camera at all. So there's something that I think is also extraordinary. It looks like um, like a, a construction tool or something like that when you're looking at it. And, and so when we're filming and it's in a war zone or it's a disaster and places like that, there's there's an intimacy that people get because they're not looking at it. When you bring a camera out um, and you're in a news situation, it's um, everybody knows there's a camera around. But if you just kind of stick this thing up, there's an opportunity, I think, to, to hide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the ideal length of narrative VR experiences. I mean, everyone seems to have a different opinion. I think it, it might m vary depending on whether it's a, it's a, um, a a commercial or advertising sort of um, bent on it versus a, a more entertainment oriented experience. But um, what what do you guys find is the the, um, the sort of the ideal format at the moment in terms of duration? I think it depends on the piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know a few minutes is generally. Uh, we, I mean, I think a few minutes generally has been proven to work really well. Um, but we actually do have a 10-minute anti-bullying piece that's coming out this fall, and um, we've been previewing it privately, and people come out and tell us that definitely did not feel like 10 minutes. Um, Does it so feel longer or it shorter? It feels a lot shorter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we still are unsure why it's very new, but um, my theory is because, you know, maybe you feel like you're actually there, and maybe it feels, you know, like it's not a very foreign environment. But to answer your question, I think maybe a few minutes has, you know, it's pretty safe, right? I mean, we, we've definitely, there's different tolerances. It's interesting you mentioned that because we've, um, actually we were doing a demo today uh, with two people in the room and uh, the, sec the first person who did the demo was watching the second person and said, wait, is, is his demo longer than mine? And I said, no, it's exactly the same amount of time. But I think when you're in, when you're in it, it's so, uh, almost analogous to a dream, it's like lucid dreaming, right? Because you know you're not there, but you're somewhere. Yeah. And so time, there's this dilation. Yeah, yeah and I think again, I, we're at such the beginning of this industry that I think when we look back in four years or five years, it'll make a lot more sense what's happening right now. And we'll understand where we're going or what this was the path leading up to. But I think for right now, it really depends on 
on, on what you're watching it on, right? Like I can be in the Vive a long time and the Gear VR a much shorter time. So it sort of depends on kind of where you are and what you're watching. And what do you think that is? Do you think that's just a function of the, of the resolution, the comfort of the headset that makes you feel like you can be in there longer? I think like a lot. I think that I think the vibe is building experiences that are meant to be sat in for a long time versus Gear VR, which is like watch this music video and watch this roller coaster and watch this you know one of our films or something like mm -hmm. that. And I think that's limiting. Um, you know, like I, w you know, we can put tilt brush on somebody and they just like paint stars for like three hours all day long, and it's like pretty yeah. interesting. Well, I think I think it is that it's that it's it's the it's a. Um, and I was being provocative when I said false about 360 video. It's I think the 360 video and immersive VR all the vibe. They're some they're, they're subtly different creatures. And I think when you're interactive, you l lose a bit more sense of time, and it becomes more elastic, right? Like you say, tilt brush for three hours. And when you're more passive in the sense of the consumption of what's what what you're you know what you're watching, I think right now the tolerance is a little lower. Yeah, right. It's happening to you versus yeah. your. Yeah, so you're doing it. I, I, we spend a lot of time thinking about the difference between like witnessing and watching, right? And so you know the the you know witnessing you're there, and then the next step on that is agency, and it's you're there, and you can walk around there and do things. Mm -hmm. And then you, now it's experiential, and so you're 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 bought in in a way that I think affords more time. And I just think that's that part of the journey that we're on with this, right? Like you've got to get through you know, mobile 360 video to get to immersive, to get to story, like we're on this to augmented reality to then become, I mean like all of these things are leading us to kind of where that format's gonna go. Yeah, that's question number nine, so <laughs> uh, we'll get there. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to um, just talk briefly about features while we're on this. Um, it just seems like it's one of those things where you, people are diametrically opposed to this on one side or the other. They're like, no, no, no one's ever gonna wanna be in a headset for that long, are you crazy? Um, you know, and uh, and yet I also think about what's happening in the the internet with our you know our, our youth and some of us that are that are used to browsing and feeling quite comfortable finding what they want for hours on end and um, and so you know do you guys have any thoughts about what that might look like in cinema uh, or a longer format even if it's a long feature length documentary what 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 will that look like in VR? I think it's uh, partly about just general social progression. Like, for example, I think part of the reason why this wave of VR has finally clicked is partly because, you know, we're finally ready as a society. Like, we, we have our phones stuck to our butts all the time, and we never let go of them and all this stuff. So it's not so foreign to us to put on a headset, and it feels natural now, right? And I think that is just part of the progression. Soon enough, it'll feel more natural and normal to to sit in tilt brush for hours at a time. Yeah, I think that it's not gonna be, I think that headsets have, are, you know, it's not headsets for long. I mean, I think that you've got, um, you know, years, f years and years, but um, where it's gonna move on with, I think, wearables and augmented reality and contact lenses and um, um, surfaces and all those other things gets, for, you know, further and further. Um, so the idea that somehow you're in a Gear VR for all day long is, it's, I don't think that's what it's gonna be like, but I think that um, people are gonna, will spend a, a, a tremendous amount of time in this. And then now that you have like Uber Eats, why does anybody ever need to leave the house? That's what I'm really scared yeah. of. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so um, that's an awesome segue to what I wanted to get into in terms of technology and how technology is so intertwined with the storytelling limitations that we have. Um, I think the reason why we're here on stage talking about new forms of art are because there, there were some new technologies or a refresh of, of technologies that, that made new things possible. But of course, this is a moving target and I, I want you guys to think about if you rolled the universe and had a giant team of, um, of programmers at Google at your disposal, what would, what would you um, wish into existence in terms of um, technology that would be like the number one or number two things that would enable you personally to tell better stories? Is it something like eye tracking, infinite treadmills, uh, light field cameras and universal capture stuff, or perhaps more of just the, the ability to interact with things like next generation UI, 
haptics, um, or, or just simply um, high resolution HMDs. If you, I know we want all of the above. You didn't give us a flag for that. Huh? You didn't give us the all the above flag. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, you can say all the above, but that's kind of a cop out, Gil. So, um, you know, I was just thinking, like, if you had to prioritize, this is about prioritization, because I think the tech guys are listening and ready to create new startups to make these things happen for us if they're not already doing it. So, I'd like to hear from everyone what, how they feel. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as for for storytelling, like, you know, where we're, where we're coming from in terms of the you know crafting stories, right? That the Certainly, the wires are an impediment. You know, the highest quality experience right now is still somewhat tethered, and 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 I think that we know that that will change, and that will be tremendous when it does. Um, I think uh, eye and face tracking, you know, that your ability to transport you into experiences, um, is really when this starts to get more profound. And I think uh, I think probably honestly, like if I was gonna wish for one thing, it would be simplicity and bandwidth. I guess that's two things together. But like, you know that that VR inherently wants to connect people, right? We're all here as storytellers uh, because we want to connect people and the limitations are about access and bandwidth and, and, and the, I, I would just wish that for everyone. I mean, that the first pitch I did for VR was if you can take 10 cell phones and put some cardboard on them and find a cell phone connection, you can create a school. So if that's the least we can do, then you know everything else is gravy on top. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, <clears throat> I, look, the, the most exciting thing has been 360 video, a mobile first 360 video for us, just kind of to step back, you know, as, a, as I think filmmakers, um, we all know that, that video sort of runs the internet and the way that we can consume video has just changed, you know, six months ago really with Facebook 360. And that in and of itself, whether or not it's the platform shift is significant enough for serious investigation and serious opportunities to re um, imagine news, documentary, filmmaking, music videos, all of these other things. So I think that we're on the right path. Um, one of the reasons that we decided to be acquired by Verizon is so that we could have their tech team being able to work on things. We just launched a new um, player. If you go onto riot.org, you could see uh, the new player that we built with Verizon, and it has, um, you know, really exciting features that are coming out that I can't talk too much about, but one of them... Oh, come that on. No, one of them that we're working on is just for us where uh, you can use gauge tracking to uh, make donations because we do a lot of things where we work with nonprofits and, you know, working on the kind of these social issues. And as a company, we've always been involved in uh, news plus action. So how do you watch what's happening in the world and also interact with it through... Um, so that's connected to Apple Pay. So it's like little things like that that I think are exciting, but the trajectory is the right trajectory that we're going on, right? Smaller cameras, cheaper cameras. Um, you know, when the Samsung, you know, Gear 360 camera becomes stereoscopic, um, will be a big breakthrough, I think, for the entire industry. Um, and, you know, the the rise of, of, of augmented reality as an app-based um, um, product, I think, with the Pokemon Go helping to lead the way, I think, is, uh, is going gonna, is gonna to put us on the right track. Uh, I would love an HMD um, with a graphics card that can play, you know, like, the 16K file, that would be really awesome. Um, we recently actually just rendered one just for fun. We couldn't play it back, though. Um, but if we could, that would have been really cool. Um, and Talk to our sponsors at AMD. Oh, yeah? They might be able to help you out. Hit me Soon. up. <laughs> um, and uh, I would also love it if rendering didn't take so long. Maybe like just more problems. What kind of rendering? What do you mean? Just, you know, rendering an MP4 even. <laughs> that would be really great. Well, luckily, more law, Moore's Law is on our side, and I think um, with all of the tech bucks behind this, then I believe we'll be blessed with amazing creations, most of which we can't predict. So uh, is it true to say that the creators in the audience and up here on the panel will be waiting with anticipation to see what new stuff we can integrate into our art? And um, I look forward to seeing what that, how that morphs our creativity over time. Um, and um, second to last question, then we'll go to some, some audience questions. Um, I, I wanna get into what the long-term impact of all this might be. They, just the idea of fully immersive storytelling. I mean, what are we really doing here? Um, you know, how is it more impactful than a feature film, um, a episode on TV? What does that do to humanity? 
what does it do for humanity? I mean, I think you know these guys are on Vanguard, and again, I, I you know I was being provocative when I put up a false flag for a 360 video, right? As VR, there's different layers of VR. I put right? it up too. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there's different layers of VR, right? And that's one of the things is it, it, we use it as a catch-all for different kinds of experiences. But um, I think what VR does is let you be somewhere else or someone else or at another time. It, it lets you obviate time and space. And when you do that with perspective, you create empathy, you create sympathy. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, uh, it's a profound, it's a profound shift. So you think that will, you know, affect the hearts and minds of, of human beings, therefore maybe impacting their behavior? I, I believe so. I think it'll, I think, I think it'll connect us in ways that we've been, we've, we've, we've used a lot of technology to disassociate ourselves, right? We, we, we you know, we, we, we text instead of talk, right? And we would call instead of speak. And this, I think, starts to bring us full circle where we'll actually be communicating again together, but not necessarily you know, physical reality, but in virtual reality. And I think that that's what, that's what the hope and the drive that we all have to do. I think it's gonna be, it's, it's all of our power to make sure that it doesn't just become shooting people games, right? And so like that, um, no offense to people who make shooting games in the audience, but, awesome. but yeah, but I mean, how do we how do we use this to to create something more than just uh, driving a car through a city and shooting people? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's back to what Gil was saying. I mean, it's uh, it's the closest thing that we can get to being in another person's body, right? Like how how special is that? Yeah. Um, and um, you know, what do you think the I guess the multi-user implications of this are like? You know, as Gil was was wishing into existence, the whole idea that you can experience this sort of empathetic thing together, perhaps with your friends, your family, even remotely, as a collaborative experience, whether you're participating or not. Um, you know, how how powerful will that be when you feel present with your friends? It's profound. You know, I, I think anyone who's done the toy box demo can speak to it. We've certainly been playing with social and it's VR I think is an inherently social medium even even just you know uh, and I'd say just pejoratively but even 360 video is social right when you're put into someone else's shoes literally or another place that you haven't been that's a social experience um, and then when you add a layer on top of that of interactive social ability right where you can be there with other people um, I think that's what really makes things that makes it sticky right yeah. it's, well, I mean, we've seen the the rise of uh, the first few collaborative um, CG experiences, and um, I'm just looking forward to the first few collaborative live action experiences, or perhaps even live event experiences. Well, we just had the, the the wave, you know, doing the the, the VR rave, which is you know spread out, uh, you know, oh, yeah. beyond the, the the walls here, and I think that's it's transcendent. Yeah. Um, and, and lastly, I really wanted to get into the um, maybe not so distant future of hopefully of AR. Um, you know, it's kind of like the elephant in the room there because everyone's going, well, you know, VR is cool and all, but it might be the transition to AR. And I wonder if you guys agree with this that the, there may be a merging of devices at some point, and what will that do to your, form, your personal drive? to create media, how will you use that in your art? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that augmented reality is everything, it changes everything, but I, I, I and you know, I've, I've often, but I don't think that it's a, a stepping stone so much as there's kind of, will be differences in the way that we talk about fully immersive versus kind of, um, you know, more augmented reality. But I think when you look at, um, and the breakthrough with augmented reality being kind of the smartphone and how, and how that will transform it. And I think that, you know, augmented reality has been around for a long time, but um, getting people where they have their phones in their pockets is a breakthrough for that. Um, but yeah, I think that we're going to start thinking about what's totally immersive versus what's augmented, and that those will kind of be the differences in there. Mm -hmm. But you think you'd you'd perhaps choose experiences that work better, maybe, in VR, and and then reserve other experiences that perhaps work better in the medium of AR. Yeah, I think it's totally different, right? Like, uh, a, I I think AR will be everywhere, and so every everything from you know. 
And and when you hear the guys or you talk to the guys at Magic Leap and you know they'll tell you that la the TV last TV you bought will be the last TV you'll ever buy and you know, screens and all those things and phones as well. So I think that every uh, thing changes with augmented reality, but um, we'll still have um, you know a great space for virtual reality where you're fully immersed in it. And I think that it's just those are they're very different in that respect. I mean, it's a you know the part of the magic of uh, we keep saying film, and I, we haven't I haven't shot film in a long time. Um, but that you know part of it is uh, escapism, and part of it is you know is exploration, right? So, you know, AR is really cool, but it's still this world, and VR is 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 any world. And so I think they have, you know, they have their own time in their own space, and I think eventually they become just different sides of the same coin. And I'll just add one more thing for storytellers: it's an, it's a really exciting time because re regardless of the medium in there, the 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 as more and more people get connected around the world to to phones and connectivity and being able to watch video, um, as we you know think about what we'll watch in our self-driving cars or our self-driving Ubers or our Hyperloops or whatever it is, it's content's not going anywhere, um, and it's just the ability I think to see more of it is. is what's rising so it's being a storyteller is a good business to be in I agree um, well uh, with that I think we should turn it over to the audience we do have a few more minutes for questions and um, don't hold back seems like we've got a few over there so but we do need to hand over one of the mics so perhaps I will hand it to the panelists Hey, uh, two quick questions. One is, do you have a run and gun audio spatial solution? Um, but as a news guy, I'm, I'm looking for that. Um, and the other is, I'm, I'm curious to all of you, with all of the different platforms, particularly with the difference in experience between headsets and like browser-based, um, what do you edit for? Uh, super, super quickly, because there's a lot of questions. Uh, we, we mostly shoot on the Samsung 360 and the jump camera, and the jump is where we get our spatial audio, um, the Odyssey. And then uh, we edit totally different for Facebook 360 versus Samsung versus uh, every platform is, is different in the way that we edit. Over here. Hi, I'm Brian Hurst from StoryTech. Do you still have your true-false cards? <laughs> OK, so in the theater, the writer has the power. In books, the writer has the power. Chris, you mentioned the word auteur at the very beginning. And so because there's no, because in, in VR the writing is experiential writing, it's more of experiential meaning than visual, I just want to know if you think that like theater, like books, and like auteur, whether the power is coming back to the writer in VR. Um, I, I, I guess I'm, 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 I won't say I'm mixed on it. I think that there is, um, uh, since anyone, certainly like, you know, with the app that we uh, unveiled uh, yesterday, our, our vision is that anyone can be a writer and a viewer. And so, it, it, you know, you can choose passive or uh, engaged, right? You can, you can be the creator, you can be the viewer. Um, so I think it's kind of a bit of both. I think, I think, um, I don't think it goes to any one discipline. I don't. I know. I think. I, I think it's balance, really. Yeah, I think for you know for any of you guys who have been to Sleep No More, and if you haven't in New York, I'd recommend it's immersive theater. I, it, you know, you get to choose your own path there, but it's still the writer who creates that incredible environment that you're in. Um, so that's pretty powerful. I guess technically, when it comes down to it, technically it's in the hands of the writer. If you have a lot of things going on, um, you are giving the power to the viewer if you so choose, right? Hey guys, thanks. Um, has there been any progress made in some sort of like universal translator in VR so that people from all over the world can speak to each other in their own uh, native languages? I, I don't know if you've had a chance while you're traveling to use Google Translate, which we use all the time. It is so unbelievably extraordinary. When, when, when we're traveling, um, we use it when in taxi cabs with subjects everywhere, and it's just an app on your phone, and it, it's, it's like, has, it's a revolutionary, I think, for travelers to be able to use it. So, I mean, I think you can see where it's going for into VR. 
Hi, my question is related to cuts and editing uh, as it relates to eye tracking. So the human visual perception system is really interesting in that we really only focus about at a thumbnail and our eyes saccade constantly several times a second to make the picture. But in between, that moment in between the saccade, our brains aren't actually receiving the data. And so I'm wondering if you've thought about how when eye tracking is available, editing and cuts might work into this sort of visual perception system and switch scenes in between saccades or, or anything. I'm just curious if you thought about it. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, the, the again, I, I think as, as, as we've all kind of touched on, like it's such early days and exploratory days, like we were, there's, there's so one layer, which is the science layer, and the secondary layer, which is the experiential layer of <laughs> the science, right? So I think eye tracking will definitely play into cuts, um, how, uh, oh, I don't even know. Yeah, that's your job. You've got yeah. to figure that out for us all. <laughs> you got to tell us. Yeah, please. Yeah, we always uh, make a point to just give the viewer a couple of seconds to just adjust to a cut, um, especially in POV, and you're like suddenly you look down and you're wearing different clothes or something. Super critical to give them a few seconds to adjust. I'd love to hear you guys uh, talk for a second about the um, challenges of crafting characters in VR. I mean, I think that like I think that Martian was a great example. Uh, crafting characters in VR, um, you know, I think it's just like any other medium whereby you're trying to make the character as interesting as possible. Um, so you start with um, the dis the writing and the the backstory of those characters, um, and then you uh, provide the the right lines, the right. Uh, mise en scène to, to perhaps enhance those characters. So I don't think there's any real difference um, unless you're perhaps um, playing the part of your own character where you know it's a little bit different because of course you get to decide who you are in the play right. or the experience, um, which will increasingly be real time and multiplayer. So. Yeah, I mean, I will, t I will say on a, a CG side, we see there are things that work really great on a flat screen that don't look so good when they're five feet in front of you um, and eight feet tall. So, you know, there, 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 is, there is a subtle differ differential, you know, as you sort of translate through uh, mediums. Um, but, uh, you know, the same thing I think holds true for live action, right? Like if you go to 360 video and someone's here, they're in your personal space and it's not fun. Thank you. Right back, right here. Um, I actually work at a uh, production company. We're actually, I think, probably one of the only ones attempting the kind of uh, insane um, thought of uh, attempting a planoptic VR theatrical feature. Um, that being kind of a, a fancy term for light field. And it's something that I've actually, I'm kind of surprised is under the radar in terms of the implications of the potentials of uh, light field, but Visiting VRLA, it um, seems entirely absent other than a tiny little secret Otoy mm -hmm. booth. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about either Lightfield or the um, any alternatives that may exist for the, the uh, six degree element of video because now I feel like we're really just being not transported to the space of the video but instead just kind of sort of virtual spherical theater whereas Lightfield, I guess the promise is that you're in the actual space, yeah, with the with the actual light. I mean, I think I think that's a great question. You know, light field um, and performance capture. You know, the idea of rather than an inside out, outside in. Uh, you know, the, there are a lot of people, uh, a number of companies working on really fantastic solutions to be able to virtualize people performing and be able to bring that into into in, into your space, right, where you can walk around. I encourage you guys. Like, there's some great demos out there of that and light field. The same way, I think that's becomes this next bridge beyond 360. Granted, it's going to add take something that's already complicated and make it more complicated for the near term. I think a lot of people agree that's that's at least one of the holy grails that we're all anticipating. I'm glad you're working on it too. Um, I think most of the people who are also working on it are still in their laboratories with a lot of caffeine, trying to make that happen. And I, I really hope they'll bless us with that very very soon. 
Um, you know, it's a moving target right now, but I think there's a lot of catch 22s to even if you can create light field, um, how you play it back, um, how do you stream it, how do you make it something that can play back on a mere mortal computer. Um, all these things are something that I think that the industry at large and some of the mad scientists out there will help us figure out soon and, and hopefully will profoundly affect the, the work you see on stage here and, and everyone else's work too. Um, when it comes to films, uh, a lot of it depends on like what the camera is looking at. L so what what I mean is like it's like how long will the camera linger? What is it going to look at? But with VR, it seems like it's very interactive. So at best, you'd lose what the camera is looking at. At the worst, you might even lose the pace the story will like even go forward at, depending on how interactive you make the movie. So I I was always <laughs> I was always wondering if the future of VR storytelling lies a bit more in medias like uh, that would be more similar to games than films. What do you guys think about this? Well, I want to let the panel talk because I'm hogging their microphone, but basically um, I, th I think it has to do with the merging of the two disciplines in general. Like, you know, there's something brilliant about live action cinematography, but what if you could record a series of performances, perhaps in light field, perhaps not, and um, pause or slow down or go into an idle in very much the same way that you program an AI performance in a game engine for an NPC character that will then wait to respond to you or wait until you're looking in that direction and then go into their line. I think there's something to be said about the game engine itself becoming the platform by which it doesn't even look like a game engine, it's just an infinite soundstage that allows you to trigger events that will feel like reality, hopefully. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that I think that's right. Uh, uh, again, I feel like we're just still trying to figure out how to tell a regular story in, in you know all all around you versus uh, as we talked about you know the different formats or what light field can do. Those things become very different. I, it, it's again a very exciting time because we've all learned, I think, how to tell you know, a six second story on Vine or how to ch tell a Snapchat story or how we tell an Instagram story or all of those ones are very different for how we tell successful stories in that. And I think as we've seen, you know, even going from movies, uh, you know, two hour movies to now, you know, short two minute th th VR 360 experiences, um, the, the rules will constantly change for that. But I do think presence, immersion, all of those pieces, light field, movement, interactivity, um, that's where it's going. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about VR being an empathy machine because I feel like it truly is. I feel like it's a revolutionary tool. I imagine, I always think about what would have happened if Martin Luther King or Harvey Milk had access to VR back then. And what the Republican Party certainly needs now is an empathy machine, right? So <laughs> we're creating a VR series about child trafficking and, and it's really brought us the, our attention to the fact that you have to be really delicate about the survivors and rescuers and all kinds of issues. And, and my question is, in terms of something like this, what are you guys doing in, ter in terms of taking your content even past the place of making it, turning it into an active engagement revolutionary tool, getting it in the hands of senators and getting it in the hands of world leaders and like what Gabo did, Gabo and Chris did, to bring this Clouds Over Cedra to the United Nations and actually act, you know, engage legislators to bring funds to the refugee camps. You guys can talk about that. That's, I'm really interested in that. Yeah, I know Riot has a lot to say about that, but um, we also are launching an anti-bullying piece this fall um, that we are uh, planning to share amongst uh, New York City uh, district schools. Can't say much more than that, unfortunately, right now, but I'm very, very excited about that, and um, let's chat afterwards. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah, for us, that's what most of what we sort of make. We've been shot for uh, Save the Children, for One.org, for Pencils of Promise. Um, uh, took people diving with dolphins with the guys who made the cove. I, I think there is a great deal of power there. To your point, it's, you know, what we all have to push for is what's beyond the empathy machine. I think empathy is easy to, to create. Like, you take somebody to a, a, a refugee camp or a slum, and it looks really sad, but... The next step is is how do you get people to take action and become a part of that solution, right? And so, like, how do you push beyond, you know, what's the next step after empathy to really, you know, whether it's compassion or whether it's, you know, whatever that part is to get them to actually do something about it is the important part that I think. I think it's easy to bring people to a space, but you've got to, got to, you know, build a campaign around the next part of it.
So good work and keep it up. Um, <clears throat> with all the different flavors of how we absorb our stories and our content these days, like I think a good example is, you know, the zeitgeist of Star Wars, where we've got video games and a website for that, and then the Lego games, and then the movies, and then the the cartoons and stuff. Um, with VR, and in a production environment sense, does it ever feel like it's a good idea to like shoot various different versions of the same thing? You're like, oh, we're gonna make a 2D, we're gonna make a classical 3D movie of the same production, and then we're gonna roll in and do it in in 3D at the same time. I mean, does it ever feel like there's opportunities for that or it's a good idea? Because with the we have so many options, I feel like the audience would just scoop up different parts of it any at any time. Well, it seems to me that um, this is the next new add-on for the transmedia buzzword, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think if the believers in true transmedia believe that it's about the core IP, it's about the universe, it's about the idea that is hypnotically awesome and therefore needs to be explored in various ways that are appropriate to the various formats. So I think what I'm seeing from most of the major studios, it just as an example, is, hey, we're building all of this stuff in 3D, 360, and shooting a lot of things, and we have the sets and actors available. Why not do a VR experience? What started out as a marketing play originally as an as a early foray is now becoming a conscious, directed, integrated piece to the media in VR too. And, and I think on the, on the CG side, that, you know, we're, we're looking at it that, that we're using VR as a story creation uh, platform for VR and outside of VR. So you know, within a 3D world, we can film differential 2D versions, 360 video, you know, what have you. Um, and so, you know, uh, again, similar to Chris's uh, point, uh, when you're into you craft this, why not? Why not let it exist in, in multiple flavors, multiple formats, multiple idioms? Uh, yeah, I'm personally all for it as long as you know it's not done in a gimmicky way. I think right now we're in a sensitive place, and if we have a lot of bad content or even mediocre content, it could be really dangerous. But otherwise, I'm you know, that sounds really cool. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on several things that are uh, running through my head all the time and also address uh, the, the last conversation you had. Um, so immersive media in general, uh, VR, gaming, no, they're, they're almost different genres, uh, but you consume them uh, you know, in a 360 sphere. Um, when you see a documentary, uh, I feel like I have a privileged point of view, and I really, really value that because it's the ultimate cinema verite, right? It's, it's just I know that people are living that reality, and, and that works for me as, as the ultimate empathy machine, right? What doesn't work for me is um, narrative. Um, it, it feels like the demands on acting are just unfulfillable. It's just so hard to act in spherical. It's, it's just, it doesn't really, you know, I, I, I don't really, I can't suspend my disbelief. I really can't. But um, gaming, when as soon as I have agency, then it, it becomes so much more engaging, right? Um, so, so agency in narrative, I feel, is the thing, you know? Um, and... Uh, the, the medium for that, I feel, is like interactive live action. So I feel like um, environments that are, you know, surveyed with photogrammetry, and then you have performances of actors, you know, maybe outside of the chaperone walls, um, and, and they can uh, relate to your dialogue and all this and that. And regarding uh, the, you know, all the, all the aspirations of changing the world, um, all the aspirations of changing the world, I feel that uh, a great way to address this is by making, you know, gameplay and interaction out of, you know, philosophy, out of, out of uh, conversations, out of asking the audiences, what do you think justice is, right? Because if we keep doing shooters, you know, every, if we have a hammer, a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? And if we gamify through, you know, these type of things, I'm just asking their, their ideas on, on this. And that's it. Thank you. 
we, let's meet up. We can talk about that one afterwards. I, I, I think that it being interactive um, is going to be a key on that. Yeah, we're, we're all about interactive. <laughs> Well, I'm really, really proud of the whole audience. No one plugged themselves in terms of their companies and whatnot. I really appreciate you guys <laughs> being so attentive. It's the last day of an amazing conference, so let's go out and party. Thank you.